Hello, this is Dr. Mike, and I wanted to um, share with you some things about the paper that, I, that I've experienced from teaching this a number of times and the things that students run into. I realize that Turabian may not be something that you're widely familiar with. It is the toolkit that historians use in writing and documenting historical works and papers. For those of you that are history majors and anticipate uh, going to graduate school, I think it will be helpful for you to be able to get some experience in this class that will pay off in great dividends for, for your future for your future graduate studies. So I wanted to kind of give you some basics and to help you kind of understand what we're looking for in, uh, in this paper. I'm gonna show you, first of all, what a uh, Turabian style paper should look like. And I'm, a, I'm sorry, but I have to use one of my own. Many of you read my bio, you know that I am a professional student. I'm 65 and I've been in class almost 57 of that 65 years. As a historian, I've been writing using Turabian since my high school days, which was the, the main thing we had when I was in high school was Turabian to write with. So you're basically using footnotes instead of in-text citations. Uh, Turabian, you'll often see it with Chicago Turabian as the, as the moniker, and there are two different fields that use this system in, in, in different ways. The Chicago part of it is used by social sciences, uh, and they do use in-text citations uh, for that, but the, the, we use the Turabian side, so that's the one that you uh, are, are most concerned about. Turabian will use footnotes. I would use footnotes over, not instead of endnotes. Endnotes is another possibility. You put all your things at the end. But for this exercise, put them at the bottom of the page, and uh, you do that automatically using Microsoft Word. That's one of the things I want to show you in, uh, in your paper. I've had students who spend a great deal of time trying to um, make the numbering work. You don't have to do that. Microsoft does it for you. And it's so much easier to um, use that convention than it is trying to make it work yourself. So in order to save you time and effort, I want to uh, I want to try to do that. Let me switch to the, first of all, the paper and um, show you what the paper should look like. I think I've still got the paper up here. Uh, but we, um, yes, here we go. Okay. I'm going to go back to page one and um, go back to the cover sheet. All, everything should have a cover sheet. Uh, I would I would encourage you, that even from the milestones, that you go ahead and get the format of your paper done and, and start putting things into that format so that uh, at the end you're not rushing around trying to get it right. They should be one document. I've had students who attempted to send me the cover sheet and in pieces don't do that. Uh, you can insert a cover sheet using the insert function at the top. Stick with plain, basic, uh, blank sheet, and then you do your typing on the blank sheet. We don't need all the colors and you know all that stuff. No color. Black and white is fine. And uh, very carefully on the cover sheet is the only place where you might use all caps as you do here with the with the school name, be sure that you you uh, uh, use the right capitalization. Uh, this is not mandatory by any means. It's just an example. Uh, but every teacher may have a little bit of a different idea of what they want on, on a paper. So uh, you can always ask, you know, what do you expect on the cover sheet? Having said that, and you will start on page two, on the first line, do not waste 15 lines and come down the middle of the paper to start. You want to conserve every inch of paper. You have a one inch margin. This one is enlarged, so it looks a little weird, so you can see it, but there's a one inch margin all the way around on all sides, and you indent the first sentence of every paragraph. This is your introductory paragraph. That should not be more than half a page. You want to say in that paragraph, this is what I'm studying, these are how we're going to look at it, and this is what I'm going to accomplish. It is the opening statement. Um, and you don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, talking about all the details. Save the details for the, uh, the body of the paper. So half a page for the introduction, I'd say half a page for the conclusion, and then as many body paragraphs as you need, but don't make the paragraphs too long because 
you're you're trying to help your reader to carry them through the paper. They don't need to get lost in the weeds by having a paragraph that goes on for pages. That that is not very helpful. Uh, be sure that you edit your paper when you're done. I would put as much time into editing my paper as I did in writing it. Uh, and so I think that's vitally important. I encourage you to, if you don't have it already, to download Grammarly.com to your computer. Uh, it will save you a lot of pain. Um, and if ever, any, there's a free version. That's what I use. I wouldn't pay for it, but uh, it was very helpful. So I run everything I write through Microsoft Spellcheck and through Grammarly. And by then, you have a lot of, most of the errors are fixed. Grammarly really is good because it will help you to fix your problems. You'll learn to spell better. You will learn to do punctuation better. You will learn to capitalize and have subject verb agreement, those kind of things. At the end of the week, it gives you a report. As you know, you spelled, you know, you had five less misspellings than you did last week. So you can kind of see your, your improvement. You will notice this paper does have footnotes. Notice how that they are stationed at the end on the outside of the punctuation. And I'm going to show you how to put those in because they refer at the bottom to the actual source that you take that from. You always cite quotations, as I've done here, or you cite where you get information from. Those are really important things to know. Uh, you don't just willy-nilly stick footnotes in to say you've got footnotes. You are footnoting things that are direct quotes and also unique information that is not common knowledge. Now, using a textbook uh, is not a good idea in a history paper. You, that's, that, is, that is for the masses. You want to write something that's more interesting, that's deeper research, that you really are bringing something to the fore about the questions you have about your civilizations that you are researching, about the seven uh, characteristics we've talked about, which of those apply. If you're doing Egypt, or you're doing Sumer, or you're doing uh, you know, uh, the Mesopotamia, any of those things, what was unique about them? For instance, the Egyptians, their location had a lot to do with their defense, they were surrounded on three sides by desert. There was, in the north, they had the Nile Delta, which made them almost impossible to be conquered. And so they were able to build a civilization much more advanced than others because they didn't have to worry about an enemy at their door all the time like Sumer would or, uh, uh, you know, the Mesopotamia. Uh, sometimes you do use headers. In Turabian, they're always centered. First, first order is centered. And then if you have a second order header, which I'll show you, it is left justified. Your paper is always left justified. You always indent the first sentence of the paragraph. You do not center your paper, your words on the on the line to try to make the paper look longer. Uh, same thing with changing margins. There is no reason to touch the margins. They they are defaulted to one inch. If you change the margins, you're saying that you're cheating, trying to make your paper look longer than it is. That does not get you anywhere, so please don't do that. Uh, the paper will automatically, if you use footnoting, will automatically give you the space you need at the bottom and shift things to the next page. So you're looking, I'm going to show you how to do page numbering as well when we get to the other documents. So basically, this is a rather long paper that I did a few months ago. Uh, it's about 17 pages, I think. But you notice how consistent it is. There's no no space wasted between paragraphs. I am a stick. I, I hate wasted space. Whether it's at the top of the page, I see people come down four or five lines and start way down here for the page. That does not constitute a page. Starting on the first line you're able to type on is is the page. So be careful with that. Um, your footnotes will be in ten point. Times New Roman, there are only two professional fonts you should be using in academic writing. One is Times New Roman, one is Arial, uh, 12 point. No reason to go bigger than that. There again, you're trying to make the page look longer than it is when you do that. 12 point is the max, and then you have to manually change your footnotes to 10 point. Uh, they don't automatically do that. So you'll notice in the footnotes, there's a particular order of how things are arranged. In this case, it is first name, last name, then the title of the book, in this case in italics, the uh, city publication, the publisher, 
the year, and then footnotes will have a page number where you got that information from. In the second instance, if you use the same source back to back, you can use the short Latin form of ibid, period, comma, and then if it's a new page number, you would do this. If it was the same page number, you just put ibid, period. So, and then if you're if you're going to use this source again after it's not on the same page, you can shorten it. This put Edgar Partisans and Redcoats page, blah blah blah. So you can actually shorten those. You don't have to repeat them every time. And you certainly don't repeat them back to back if you're using the same source more than one time on a page. Uh, notice here, went to a different page, uh, and this could have been short, but it's not. So but you're using first name, last name. Um, and you do want to put, use footnotes rather than endnotes. Um, just for, you know, the sake of this paper. Here's several. Notice several footnotes, uh, how they're done. And they're in order in the paper, just like this. If you have to go back and change and add a footnote, it will automatically change all your numbers for you. You don't have to worry about changing those for yourself. Okay. So then we get down to the bibliography. And this is where all your sources are. For every source you have on the back page, you should have a footnote in the paper. You don't put books on here just to say, well, I, I walked by the library saw this book on the shelf. No, you take it and you, you're using it as a part of your research. You cannot do this paper without doing the research. You cannot write off the top of your head. Uh, and you better not write it off of the AI stuff because that's considered plagiarism. You don't copy it off the website. You don't copy it off the book. All those things will get you in great trouble. You need to be, I want to see how you read, how you analyze, how you tell the story. That's the purpose of this, this writing exercise. So you come to your sources. Uh, the, for Turabian, the source page is called the bibliography. You break out your primary sources and your secondary sources. This is a secondary header, so it's left justified and bolded. And these are primary sources. Notice here that the order changes. It's last name, first name, and you put them in that alphabetical order, B, C, B, C J, like that. Now, you need to understand what a primary source is. This is probably the most misunderstood thing about this assignment. It is not something that's been written about your subject. It is something that has been written during the time you're writing about. So if you're doing Egyptians, the Book of the Dead would be a primary source that was written back in the day. If you're doing Greeks, uh, it could be Herodotus's history, it could be any of the Greek philosophers. Those were writing in that time. Anything else is not a primary source. Depending on the subject you use, you may, uh, you know, you may struggle with that a bit. The Mayans, the Aztecs, the Incas uh, didn't have a written language, so there won't be any technically primary sources. But you may have something written by a Catholic priest in the 1500s, and you tell your reader that this is as close as we can get because there was no written language due to the limitations. Secondary sources done the same way. These are things written about the source. This is where most of your stuff comes from. You want to be sure that you have good sources. Now, what is a good source? A good source is somebody something that's been written usually by a professor. It will have an EDU ending or ORG ending on the, on the link. Uh, and you don't, you are very wary about using uh, .com sites or websites because a lot of that stuff is conspiracy theory stuff. You don't want to use that. That is not valid history. You do not use Wikipedia in writing a history paper because it is open source. Anybody can go online and can uh, add to whatever they want to add to that. Having said that, sometimes you can look at Wikipedia. Maybe get a good idea of an outline or find good sources. Sometimes you can find uh, original sources, primary sources, and you can go to them, you can get some things to use in your paper. I'm telling you, though, that you need to spend this time in, uh, of the eight weeks in doing this, doing your research. You cannot uh, do well on this paper unless you do the research. Uh, that is vital. You do the reading, put in the time, learn your subject, and then put your sources away and uh, 
write about your sources. So uh, that's really important because you want to do a really good job. I, I said the night in the uh, in the meeting that the worst thing that I could think of is that you would uh, that you would have a great source and that you would uh, do a poor job. That's the worst thing I can think of. That you've got a, a a wonderful source and yet you do a crummy job of it. So you really want to do a good job. You want to you want to make yourself proud. You don't ever want to write something that you know, you'd be ashamed of. Okay, let me show you about page numbers. This already has a page number in it, but I did last time. Uh, but I want you to, um, to uh, this allows me to get rid of page numbers. So that didn't work. Anyway, uh, go ahead and set your your uh, paper up. And uh, I always put in your, uh, your cover sheet, put your cursor at the first spot here, Go over to insert, and uh, you hit blank. You don't need all this fancy stuff. You just want to add a blank page. And um, actually, where is it? Uh, but it should put in right in the front. So you want that first page. Do your cover sheet like I showed you, and then go there and put your cursor on the first spot on that page and do insert and do page number here. All right, you want at the top right hand side. So you hit top page, come down. I usually use this one because it allows me to put my name in um, instead of page. Okay, and you got page one. Now you don't want a page number on your cover sheet. So you click this little box here that says a uh, different pa first page. Okay, and when you close it, it would normally take it out. It was not doing here because I messed it up. It will take it off your cover sheet. Your first, your second page will start with page two. Remember that you're going to start writing on the first line. It'll come down five pages. Okay, so let me show you how to do uh, footnotes. So we want to do a footnote here. Uh, we put our cursor in the first place to the right hand side of your punctuation. You go up to references. You go to insert footnote. That immediately puts the little number up there for you. If you don't have to worry about that, it takes you down to the bottom of the page, and it allows you to put in, type in the footnote. I'm going to use one I used before, so I'm going to type it again. Uh, but I'm going to this, this is what you would type in. Notice for footnotes, it's first name, last name, title of the book, uh, which is in italics, uh, the city of publication, the publisher. The year is published, and in a footnote, you're going to have a page number. All right, where did I find that in the book? I could go to that book, turn to page 31. I can see what you what you took it from. Okay, um, so that that's how you do a footnote, and then of course, if you have to go back and add a footnote, it will automatically rearrange all your footnote numbers, so you don't have to worry about going and changing every number again. It does that. You know that. You'll notice these other footnotes. Uh, this is a shorthand version here because this book has been used already. So uh, you, you can just use the author's last name, his, the title of his book, and the page number. So this is where all your footnotes are done. And then, of course, you go to the bibliography page at the back, and you will do a full, uh, full footnote. And in that case, you'll do last name, first name. Now, notice that there is a difference in the, the uh, format. Footnotes should be done, uh, first line will be tabbed in one tab, and your second line would be left justified. On the bibliography page, it's exactly the opposite. The first line is left justified, and every other line in that source is um, tabbed in. You have one space between footnotes, on that bibliography page, you will have one space between sources. So I'm hoping that this will kind of help you. I'm available to help to talk to you about it. Uh, I'll give you feedback when we come up on our first milestone. Go ahead and put in those pieces that you know uh, and, and start getting things ready. It will make your life a lot easier. Uh, and as I said, always go back and edit your, your piece because uh, I put as much time into editing as I did in writing. Uh, your brain kind of has a convention that it, it looks at your writing as perfect. It doesn't see your mistakes. It sees everybody else's. 
uh, in order to get around that, read the paper to yourself aloud, and it kind of breaks that hold your brain has over your vision, and you can see most of your, your mistakes. From one milestone to the other, you take the feedback from the first week, you put it back into the next writing assignment, and be sure that you don't ignore it uh, and make the same mistakes again. That is a fool's error. Uh, they keep making the same mistake when you know it's wrong and you haven't read the feedback, it is compounding the error that will not end up well for you in the final paper. So let me encourage you to that. I hope you can come to the live chats. We can go over anything there you want to talk about, uh, bring your questions, or if you need a private a Zoom conference, let me know that, and I'll be glad to set that up. But uh, let's get let's have a good semester, good term. I think you may enjoy this class and get some great things from it. Thank you so much.